we're going to be talking about organisms because, well, that's what biology is all about. It's the study of life. So diving right into it, we have so many different types of organisms. How do we different? How do we categorize organisms? We have an otter, we have a mongoose, we have a mango tree, we have grass, we have bacteria, we have mushrooms, we have algae, so many different types of organisms. So the best way to classify organisms is to put them into two big groups first. And the two big groups are called prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes are basically organisms where their cells do not have a nucleus, and eukaryotes are basically organisms where their cells will have a nucleus. That's the easiest way to classify the organisms first. And of course, under prokaryotes, examples of prokaryotes will be bacteria. And under eukaryotes over here, we have four different types of eukaryotes. They're divided into many different kingdoms. Kingdom animalia, kingdom plantae, kingdom protists, and kingdom fungi. But our main focus for this chapter will be bacteria, animals, and plants, as I've highlighted over there. But before we start with anything, we have to ask ourselves the question, how did life come to be? Where did animals come from? Where did plants come from? How have they always existed on Earth? We are not exactly sure how life came to be, but there are a few ideas of how life happened. And to understand that, we're going to be looking at something called the endosymbiotic theory. So about 3.5 billion years ago, life on Earth was extremely different from what it is right now. You know, right now the world is a bit more stable. You know, uh, we have a lot of oxygen in the air that can support a lot of life. But 3.5 billion years ago was probably a different time. A lot of volcano eruption, not much of an ozone layer, and not much of oxygen that was in the atmosphere. So life 3.5 billion years ago was probably just... There were no animals, but what the earth was filled with was probably all these small little organisms that were microscopic, known as prokaryotes. And how do we know that these are prokaryotes? As you can see, these prokaryotes were all made up of simple fundamental structures. They had DNA, they had ribosome, they had a cell membrane, and they also had the cytoplasm inside the cell. I didn't, I did not label the cytoplasm, but this is just basically an example of a prokaryote right here, and this is known as an anaerobic prokaryote. It would have carried out anaerobic respiration. There would have been many other different types of prokaryotes. These prokaryotes might have been smaller, but their basic structures were still the same. They would have had their DNA, they would have had a ribosome, they would have had a cell surface membrane, and also a cytoplasm. And for example, just for our own situation here, we have an aerobic prokaryote. The difference between aerobic and anaerobic prokaryotes, well, it's in the name. Anaerobic prokaryotes carry out a process known as anaerobic respiration. Aerobic prokaryotes carry out a process known as aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration just means that they use oxygen when they're breaking down organic molecules. Now, life for these prokaryotes were pretty simple. It's either eat or be eaten by the other organism. And as you can see in this diagram over here, which organism has the advantage? Yes, obviously it's the anaerobic prokaryote because its size is bigger. So if it saw the aerobic prokaryote, it would have been thinking, is this food for me? So its main goal is it would have tried to ingest the aerobic prokaryote. It would have tried to engulf it through a process known as endocytosis. So it would have tried to swallow the aerobic prokaryote and it might have succeeded in doing so. So right now, the aerobic prokaryote is inside the organism, as you can see here. And the anaerobic prokaryote would, would have tried to digest the smaller organism. But here's where something interesting might have happened. 
this might have started the beginning of a sort of beautiful friendship. Because in this case over here, instead of one organism eating and digesting the other, these two organisms started living together. Or to be more specific, one organism was living inside another organism. Why is this important or why did I call this a beautiful friendship? Because the beautiful friendship is as such. The smaller microorganism could now be protected by the larger organism and the smaller organism can actually provide more ATP. The larger organism, however, because it's large, it can provide protection for the smaller organism. And the small organism right now does not have to focus on looking for food. The large organism can provide food. And all the smaller organism has to do is it just has to provide ATP. And thus, these two organisms over here started living together. And this was known as the concept endosymbiosis. Symbiosis meaning working together, endo meaning within. So an organism living within another organism and both of them starting to work together. these two organisms had a higher chance of survival and because of the extra surplus of energy, the prokaryote could have become slightly larger. Perhaps during one point in the evolution, the cell wanted to become more organized. Now, what does it mean by becoming more organized? Remember, the characteristic of life, it needs to carry out respiration, it needs to move, it needs to grow, it needs to carry out, it needs to get nutrition, it needs to reproduce, it needs to excrete, and also, more importantly, it needs to carry out homeostasis. How can the cell carry out all these processes in a more organized fashion? And that's where the cell did something pretty brilliant. And they did something called compartmentalization. Compartmentalization just basically means putting things into rooms or compartments to make things more efficient. What do I mean by that? How do you make it more efficient and how do you make it more organized? Basically, what the cell did, the cell actually just became slightly larger. They started to build smaller rooms within the cell. You can see a room which is, uh, I've, I've put a room where it's a yellow circle over there. And inside the room with the yellow circle, they stored the DNA of the organism. They also created another room within the cell. And inside that room, they stored the ribosomes to make it more efficient. They created another room to put specific enzymes inside there. Another room over there, perhaps for another function. So each of these rooms inside the cells were all having their own partition and the partition were all made out of membranes. They were separated by membranes. If you are a little bit confused by this, imagine a house. If you had a house, but there were, it was not organized, you did not have a bedroom, you did not have a toilet, you did not have a kitchen, everything is so mishmashed, basically. You want to create partitions in your home so that there is one room that is designated for the bedroom. There is another room that is designated for the kitchen. There is another bed, there's another room that is designated as the toilet. So it makes that one entire space divided into smaller spaces in an attempt to make it more organized. Same concept happened in the cell as well. The cell created divisions and rooms so that they could be more organized. And as you can see here, some of the rooms, or one of the rooms is there to modify protein, one of the rooms is to store DNA, synthesize lipid, synthesize proteins, and another room is to produce ATP. Now, you might be thinking, okay, so fine, the cell is more organized, it has specific rooms to do specific things. Again, how is this relevant? And this is where it became through a longer period of time. The room that stored the DNA changed over millions, if not billions of years. And that's when you get the nucleus. What about the room that is to synthesize the protein? That is how the endoplasmic reticulum came to be. The room that is to synthesize the lipid, that's how you get the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. 
The womb that was supposed to modify the proteins, Golgi apparatus. The womb that is supposed to produce ATP, that is the mitochondrion. You see, by having all these cell structures did not just accidentally came to be. It was an attempt of the cell trying its very best to be more organized in order to increase its chances of survival. And lo and behold, this is how you get an animal cell. If you remember, 3.5 billion years ago, there were two organisms, there were two prokaryotic organisms over there, and the two prokaryotic organisms carried out a process known as endosymbiosis. They started living together, the combination of these two organisms became larger, they became more organized, and they evolved to become what is known as the typical or ancestor animal cell over here. And it is also very important to note that if you look at this cell, this animal cell, where is the DNA found? Most of the times students will say that the DNA is found in the nucleus, but never forget that the mitochondria will also have its own DNA. Some students will be very surprised. What do you mean that the mitochondria has its own DNA? Yes, because look at the link from 3.5 billion years ago. Look at that smaller organism on the left, the one on the corner of the left over there, where I'm going to be highlighting it in a blue color. The smaller prokaryote had its own DNA. I'm just linking the bridge to show you how they are all connected to each other. There you go. So the mitochondrion has its own DNA. And our nucleus also inherited the DNA from the larger prokaryote. And that DNA was stored in the nucleus, and that's how we get a present day DNA. So what you have to understand from this is the first animal cells that were formed on Earth was actually the result of two prokaryotes living together. You and I, we are animals. We are humans, obviously, but we are made up of animal cells. We are so used to thinking of ourselves as humans that we actually share a link. We are just the result of two prokaryotes working together. How's that for an existential crisis? <laughs> but are you a bacterium? No, of course not. You are still a human at the end of the day. We all have such humble beginnings. Let's look at plant cells. Plant cells also have, uh, we think that plant cells also have a humble beginning, just like the animal cells. But in this case over here, it involves three prokaryotes about billions of years ago. And this prokaryote, the one in green in color right there, it also had its own DNA. And this was called a photosynthetic prokaryote. It could carry out the process known as photosynthesis on its own. It was a living organism. But what probably would have happened is it might have been swallowed by the larger organism as well. The larger organism, yeah, it is a little bit hungry. It's, it's swallowing everything that is smaller. And they started working together. So right now, the photosynthetic prokaryote is living inside the larger organism. It has protection. All it has to do is carry out photosynthesis and it could feed all the other organisms and they can work together. So now you have three organisms living together. How could it become more organized? It became a bit larger. That was the photosynthetic prokaryote right there. I'm just adding it in. And now because of compartmentalization, you could have created another room, remember? Because to make it more organized. And that other room over there, what was its function inside the cell? This function over here was to carry out a process known as photosynthesis. Through billions of years of evolution became what is known today as the chloroplast. There you go. And the cell might have had its own vacuole 
And because it had chloroplasts, it could have created special type of carbohydrates known as cellulose. And lo and behold, it could have also built its own cell wall, perhaps. And that is how you got the ancestor plant cells. And of course, the chloroplast, it also has its own DNA because it actually originated from a prokaryote billions of years ago. How is it able to have its own DNA? Let's see the link from the one on the left, the photosynthetic prokaryote. It was engulfed by the organism. It became larger. They started working together. And lo and behold, it became what is known as the chloroplast, and it also has its own DNA.